Well, what's involved in producing a reissue, uh, like producing an album, um, you start from scratch. Um, it's the concept, then it's the research, then the most important part in producing a reissue is finding the right source material. Then finding the right engineer who's simpatico with what you want to hear, and then putting it all together and making it make sense and getting the company to A, do it, B, do it for a, you know, a reasonable price point, and boom, then you're home. To, to give you an idea of what uh, the problems were in finding the proper um, tapes, when, when the record industry eliminated mono in the late 60s, um, Columbia started putting out electronically rechanneled stereo, hideous things, uh, for a lot of their 50s material, uh, including the Miles Davis album Milestones. When I started to work on uh, my research for the uh, Miles Davis set of the complete Columbia recordings of the band with uh, 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 John Coltrane and um, Red Garland, um, I found that there were three track masters of the entire Milestone Sessions. And this was in maybe 1992. In the meantime, Columbia had been peddling this hideous electronically rechanneled stereo from a mono master, and no one ever thought to look to see if there was a three track master. So th that kind of, the source material and the detective work is probably uh, combined with a, a certain intelligence and an idea of what you want to go for is is really the most important aspect of reissues. Finding something that's never been heard before and causing it to come out uh, for me was always an incredibly gratifying thing, whether I was doing it on Blue Note or Columbia or Mosaic. Um, and the thing is, even if you put something out and it only sells a thousand copies and gets deleted in two years, once you put it out, it exists. Once it's out in the world, it's out in the world. It can get copied, it can get analyzed, it can get critiqued. But if it's just sitting on a shelf, it only exists in, in a theoretical way. It does not exist. So getting stuff out and always applying good judgment to not, not put out garbage but getting good stuff out um, was always the most satisfying thing for me because at least then it was, it's, it's, it's in the history, it's in the stream of things, and I'm done. There's two reasons why reissues um, have a, an incredible second life. And one is for people our age who were around when the music first came out, and for us, the, there is a, uh, an upgrade in the quality of the music. And there's also, if you're doing your job right, there is more annotation and more information that comes with each successive reissue. For um, younger people who weren't around when this happened, and I remember feeling strongly about this when Bruce Lundvall and I restarted Blue Note in 1985, um, the reissues were of incredible importance because n n most of that material was not available at all at the time. And there was a whole young group in the early 80s of music students uh, uh, who became professional musicians who didn't have access to this incredible body of work. And once you make it available to them, it sends out that information and that information affects the future as much as it celebrates the past. The Sonny Rollins Village Gate material uh, runs from completely irrelevant to sublime. Uh, some of the stuff is magnificent. Other things are just self-indulgent and go nowhere. Um, and you, you would always hope that the material would be in the hands of someone that would use judgment um, and consider the artist and consider the music, and only put out what enhances the music and what enhances the artists involved. 
Um, this is an example of what I call the public domain whores who just um, throw stuff out. And uh, they do it because they're zealous but tasteless fans. Um, and that, to me, doesn't, does, doesn't serve the music well. There's still, you know, after 40 years of doing Blue Note, there's still a few things unissued. And believe me, they're unissued for a very good reason.